thank you very much, uh, Wendy, and um, to NYSET also for collaborating uh, with us uh, on this important issue. Um, very briefly, Grassroots Environmental Education is an environmental uh, health nonprofit. Um, we have a mission to educate the public about the links between common environmental exposures and human health. Um, we have worked um, very closely with, um, with New York State. Uh, some of the uh, legislation that you might be familiar with would be the, uh, the green cleaning products law that we were very much involved with, um, the state ed idling recommendation, which is a zero idling policy, and the Child Safe Playing Fields Act, which was uh, the ban of the use of pesticides on all school grounds, kindergarten through 12th grade, including daycare and pre-K. Um, we, have, uh, we have done many uh, different things that involve children at a very um, young age, and this particular issue uh, we are actually talking about, uh, about pregnant women and uh, fetal development. So you can change slides now. Okay. So this new project is called the Baby Safe Project. And uh, we have done some work over the past few years on wireless radiation, which is what the Baby Safe Project is about. And last spring, we became involved in a campaign to warn pregnant women about uh, exposures to their unborn child. And since pregnant women already take certain precautions to protect their developing babies, uh, as you're probably familiar, um, we, uh, you know, we, we don't drink alcohol or smoke or eat tuna fish sandwiches <laughs> because of the mercury content. Um, but we thought that this, uh, this particular demographic would be particularly receptive um, to this issue. So the campaign rolled out in June of 2014 with a press conference in New York City. And the website, babysafeproject.org, contains a video with experts as well as pregnant women um, and links to peer-reviewed science, a joint statement which was signed by doctors and researchers around the world urging precaution and calling for more research on this issue, recommendations for reducing exposures, and downloadable informational brochure which is in both English and Spanish. It was created for distribution at birthing centers, OBGYN practices, and has been widely disseminated. Change slide. So we actually decided to move forward with this project after meeting with Dr. Hugh Taylor um, about his recent research at Yale Medical School. And in his research, he found that pregnant mice exposed to wireless radiation from cell phones had offspring who exhibited signs of ADHD and impaired memory, among other abnormal behaviors. The study confirms what other studies have shown, and that is that exposure to wireless radiation actually has biological effects on the human body including neurological harm. We collaborated on this BabySafe project with Dr. Taylor, who is the head of reproductive sciences and OBGYN at Yale Medical School, as well as Dr. Deborah Davis, formerly with the National Academy of Sciences and now at Berkeley and executive director of Environmental Health Trust. Slide change. So after deciding to examine work environments and occupational exposures, we actually looked for places where simple steps could be taken to reduce the risks. In schools, we were also very cognizant of the particularly sensitive perspective that teachers have as they work every day with children who suffer from behavioral and learning disorders. We also acknowledge that the teaching profession attacks young women of childbearing age. While it is impossible in this wireless world we live in to avoid all exposures to microwave radiation, we do know that proximity is very important and that actually moving just a few feet away from a wireless router or other wireless devices can significantly reduce the radiation. We also avoid, advocate strongly for devices that can be turned off when not in use or in a perfect scenario, a hardwired internet environment. And we're talking here about Ethernet cables or fiber optics. And this is being done in other countries to protect people in schools. And as we become more educated, we are requesting access to the Internet without the risks, which is really possible. Slide change. And there's 44 participants. So there's a growing body of science that supports reducing exposure to wireless radiation, and we urge you to visit thebabysafeproject.org, 
that's babysafe, S-A-F-E, project.org, to learn more and read the science. Wow. So I would like to introduce Magda Havas, Dr. Magda Havas. She is an associate professor of environmental and resource studies at Trent University, where she teaches and does research on the biological effects of environmental contaminants. Dr. Havas relieved her, received her PhD from the University of Toronto and completed postdoctoral research at Cornell University. Okay. Dr. Havas's research since the 1990s is, con okay. is concerned with the biological effects of electromagnetic pollution, including radio frequency radiation, electromagnetic fields, dirty electricity, and ground current. She has given talks in more than a dozen countries on her research and provides expert testimony on the health effects of electromagnetic pollution as they relate to occupational exposure, high voltage transmission lines, magnetic fields, and both cell phone and broadcast antennas. So welcome, Dr. Havas. Thank you very much. Can people hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, well, I'm going to be starting out, and I've labeled my talk, Our Love Affair with Wireless Technology is Making Us Sick. Um, I think everyone here recognizes how much wireless technology we have. And can I get the next slide, please? I'm going to give you an example of how quickly we've adopted uh, Wi-Fi networks. This is a map of the United States in 2002. And by the way, this information is available for the entire planet at the link um, that we have at the bottom of the page. And I used to have an arrow, but I can't seem to find it right now. Um, anyway, at, at wiggle.net, you can get this information. So in the United States, only Chicago and parts of California and parts of New York had Wi-Fi um, access, mostly in universities. Next slide, please. By 2004, it had grown considerably. Next slide. 2008, next slide. 2012, so next slide, please. So within a 10-year period, we've gone from virtually uh, very, very limited use of Wi-Fi to considerable use of Wi-Fi in our everyday work experience. And actually, some of you <laughs> might be connected via Wi-Fi to the computers you're using. Next slide, please. In school, since we're talking uh, about New York um, City teachers, um, New York schools, uh, and schools across the nation, there are two key issues about wireless technology. One is the Wi-Fi within the school, and the other is nearby cell phone antennas that might be irradiating. <laughs> Next slide, please. And what's fascinating to me is that there's a lot of people who are experiencing chronic ill health. And the number seems to be increasing, and the chronic ill health seems to be occurring at younger and younger ages. And if you link this chronic ill health and some of the symptoms or some of the illnesses are in this uh, uh, slide, uh, they seem to be increasing exponentially along with our exponential exposure to microwave and radio frequency radiation. Next slide, please. Here we have the electromagnetic spectrum, and I, I, I use the spectrum because uh, some of the terminology that's used is used inconsistently, and I just would like to express how I'm using it. You can see in this graph at the bottom, this is the electromagnetic spectrum. At the bottom, we have very low frequencies, and as the frequencies go, um, as you go up the uh, chart, the frequencies get higher, the energy gets higher, and the wavelength gets much smaller. And scientists have given different names to different parts of the spectrum, extremely low frequency at the bottom. And then you can see I have a blue box around this area called radio frequency radiation. And what I'd like to draw your attention to is that microwaves and radar overlap with radio frequency radiation. And so some people call microwaves radio frequency, which is correct. Um, radar is, is microwaves and radio frequency. And so I'm going to be using microwaves to really refer to the top end of the spectrum. The difference between microwaves and lower frequencies within the radio range are things like television and radio. They're not microwaves. They're, they're some, uh, signals are actually sent at lower frequencies than within the radio band of the spectrum. There's a box on the left that shows you the various types of technologies that use radio frequency radiation. And you can see at the bottom, we even have fluorescent light bulbs. And some of the manufacturers mentioned that these light bulbs can inter interfere with uh, telecommunication because of that radio frequency. Next slide, please. 
Now, it's very difficult to let people know how this radiation interacts with materials and living objects until you realize that light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And a lot of the characteristics of light are also characteristics of microwaves. So for example, this slide shows that light can be transmitted through glass. Uh, it can be reflected by mirrors. It can be focused by a magnifying glass. And different colors will, will absorb light differently. Some will reflect it, some will absorb it, uh, converting it to heat. Next slide, please. Microwave radiation has the same um, uh, uh, properties. So microwaves can penetrate buildings. That's why we can use our cell phones inside buildings. Metal objects can reflect and focus microwave radiation. And we know that water and fat absorb the radiation. And that's why you can put water or a baked potato or a potato in a microwave oven. But if you put dried rice in, it won't heat up because there's just not enough water at that uh, particular frequency. Next slide, please. And that's true for products that we might wear in and around our body. So if you have a metal implant in your body and you're exposed to microwave radiation, what will happen is that implant will reflect the radiation and part of your tissue around the metal will actually begin to heat up. For women, this is a real concern if you have um, IUD devices, if you have underwire bras, uh, and in some cases, jewelry. Metal fillings is another uh, key issue, especially for children in schools if they're near Wi-Fi routers. Next, please. This is a schematic of what the different base stations uh, would look like within uh, a school system. All the red circles are supposed to represent these uh, base stations. And base stations have multiple antennas, and they are constantly emitting microwave radiation. Next slide, please. So if we were to see what this radiation looked like, it would be those concentric circles around the individual base stations. And this is called the beacon signal. The beacon signal is on 24-7 unless you turn that particular base station off. Uh, it would be on. And it uses energy. And so one of the key concerns is that you know, we, we go out of rooms. With, when, uh, when we go out of rooms, we turn lights off, but we leave these beacon signals on 24-7. Next slide, please. In a school environment, the two highest exposures are going to occur near the router and near the wireless device that's connecting to the router. So children who have um, laptops or um, tablets uh, that are connected to the Internet and they're uploading or downloading information are going to be exposed, uh, getting much higher exposures than someone who's not doing this. However, they put routers uh, in classrooms now, and teachers very often can be standing very close to them, and so they are likely to get the highest exposure. The more students that are uploading and downloading information, the higher the levels within the class. Next slide, please. Now, people tell me, but Wi-Fi, the levels of Wi-Fi are so low. They're much lower than cell phones. And you know, if, if, you're, if they're um, not concerned about smart meters, they said they're much lower than smart meters and cell phone towers. Uh, and this is simply not the case. In this particular example, we have different studies uh, showing that there's an increase in cancer in Germany at 0.38 microwatts per centimeter squared. That's just the power density. Uh, cancer in Brazil, electrical hypersensitivity in Austria, cancer in, in Israel. You can see that those cancers are occurring at very, very low levels. We have sterility in mice from a study in Greece at 1.05 microwatts per centimeter squared, heart problems at 3, and hormone um, problems, uh, reduced hormone uh, levels and hormone activity in people who live near cell, cell phone base stations at 6.7. Next slide, please. If we now uh, add information that we received here in, in um, uh, Ontario, Canada, on levels in the classroom, we have two examples. This is a, a classroom that had no routers, the first slide, and, and the levels were 2 microwatts per centimeter squared. Um, the one to the right of that that had the highest level posted was 8.3 microwatts per centimeter squared. And you can see that these values are much higher than some of the, um, the, the symptoms that we're getting, the sterility, the heart problems, hormone, and cancer. And what's fascinating is that in neither one of those classrooms were there any computers operating. So this is simply the background from the router in the classroom. Next slide, please. One of the other studies, uh, types of studies that are uh, showing up is that microwave radiation affects sperm. 
And here the key problems are uh, related to the motility of the sperm, uh, the fact that the sperm is fragmented, um, and the fact that the sperm is um, uh, not viable for a long period of time. So couples wanting to get pregnant, if the male uh, has a cell phone in his pocket, has a laptop computer and uses it on his lap uh, for extended periods of time, this could actually interfere with their ability to conceive. Um, and if the sperm is damaged and the, the couple still conceives, then there's uh, potential for genetic uh, damage to the offspring. Next, please. We had studies um, in the 1980s and 90s um, and in the late, late 70s showing that women who worked near uh, video display terminals had an increased risk of miscarriage. And you can see that there's definitely a risk to the fetus for a woman who is using her computer in a wireless mode and holding it very close to the belly. Now there is evidence that some of this microwave radiation is absorbed by the fluid in the mother's body, but the head of the fetus, if it's in the right position, is going to be the closest to that computer the way you see it in this particular diet. And I think this is something that we have to take very, very seriously uh, because we know that the younger the organism is, the more susceptible it is to damage. And if the damage occurs during a certain period of development, you can have uh, changes in limbs, spinal cord, uh, brain activity, neurological damage, depending on um, uh, how the developmental stage of the fetus. So there is definitely a risk to the fetus by having this technology close to the body. Next, please. Now, one of the things that doctors say is you should not drink, you should not smoke, you should not take certain types of medication while you're pregnant. They should also be insisting that women who are pregnant not be exposed to wireless technology. And it goes beyond Wi-Fi. It's a cell phone. It's um, a cordless phones in the home. It's living near cell towers. Um, and if they already have an infant in the house, they might have wireless baby monitors. And this is a very, very serious risk to the newborn uh, as well as to the parent who uh, has the parental end of the monitor with them. Next, please. Now, many of you know that in 2013, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, a branch of the World Health Organization, came out with a warning that radiofrequency radiation is a possible human carcinogen. And there is a call now from scientists that really it should be not a uh, 2B carcinogen, which is possible, not even a 2A carcinogen, carcinogen, which is probable. They're actually calling it to be a class 1 carcinogen, that uh, we have enough evidence that it is uh, carcinogenic. In this press release, they only mention gliomas and they uh, mention uh, wireless phone use. And unfortunately, the media thought this is all they were referring to. But when you contact the IARC uh, uh, working group who looked at this, they say, no, we're not talking about a, a specific type of device. We're actually talking about the entire range of radio frequency radiation. And any device that generates that radiation can uh, contribute. Next slide. And the types of cancers we're talking about are things like gliomas uh, that you can see in the middle top acoustic neuroma that affects your hearing. Uh, this is actually a tumor. It's not carcinogenic, um, but it can be quite damaging to the hearing apparatus. And if they have to remove it, obviously there could be some neural damage during the operation. Uh, parotid, tumor, parotid gland tumors or salivary gland tumors. Uveal melanomas is another one that has limited evidence. And women who keep their cell phones uh, in their bra, um, what we're finding is that there's actually an increase in um, breast cancer right where the phone is kept. By the way, the brain tumors and, and other types of tumors associated with the head tend to occur on the same side of the head that you're using the cell phone. Other studies show have been done with mice uh, showing an increase in um, um, primary and uh, metastatic tumors. And people who live near cell towers in the middle of that slide, there have been a number of studies showing that there's an increased risk of both developing cancer and dying from cancer. Yeah. No, no, I'm listening to this webinar. It was kind I'm of sorry, someone else is talking. Um, if they could just mute themselves, please. Can I get the next slide, please? Now, when it comes to um, how, what is the best way to use this technology? Well. The worst way, next slide please, is the way that most schools are 
um, producing it. It's Wi-Fi everywhere, always on, very powerful Wi-Fi antennas. The, the Wi-Fi technology that we have in schools is actually uh, much more powerful than the Wi-Fi technology that you have in your home. It has to go through concrete walls. In some cases, it has to serve multiple. So we're really talking about uh, a very powerful form of Wi-Fi in an uh, industrial or a school setting compared to the home. So this is the worst option to have it on all the time. Can I get the next slide, please? A better option is modified use, limited locations, and really turning it off when it's not in use, and adjusting student and, and, and teacher behavior. And the way that you do this is you can, you can actually have Wi-Fi turned off in your, in your location. And when the students are ready to upload or download something, you give them a certain amount of time to do that. And then once they have the information, they can disconnect from the Internet as well. So they can turn the Wi-Fi off. They can put their device into airplane mode. And this would be far, far better for schools that um, insist on using wireless technology to access the Internet. Next slide. And the best uh, way to do it is actually to go through uh, a wired connection. Next slide, please. The two types of wired connections are Ethernet and fiber optics. Ethernet is, is uh, probably the least expensive. And many schools who have gone the Wi-Fi route already had Ethernet. So they have a redundancy of the system. And it's very important that the Ethernet cables not be removed from the school, that they simply uh, turn the devices off in a location where Ethernet is available. The fiber optics make sense in a community where they have external fi um, fiber optics. Both of these technologies are not only healthier in the sense that they don't emit um, microwave radiation through the air, um, they're also much more secure. They're actually faster than wireless technology. So going to these two routes is, is a much better option. By the way, the previous slide where I showed that um, even disconnecting the Internet when you're not using it uh, makes sense. Um, in British Columbia, the teachers' union actually uh, presented this. And the rationale they used was that it would save uh, the school money because you have, a flash, you, know, you have that technology working. It's consuming energy. It's not needed. It should actually be turned off. So they uh, presented this as a way of uh, saving money through energy consumption rather than as a health concern. Next slide, please. Now, there are a number of agencies around the world, um, and I've already mentioned the IARC, that it's a possible human carcinogen. In, health, in Canada, the Health, health Canada stated that children should reduce their exposure. And I think the FCC did the same thing in the United States a few years ago. The American Academy of Pediatrics um, is recommending that levels be lower, that the current exposure levels are, do not protect children. They were actually based on military personnel, so we're talking about uh, physically fit, strong young men, uh, six foot tall, 200 pounds, um, that that was what it was protecting them against. And it was only protecting them against heating. So we know that there are effects well below heating. And we know that young children have uh, very different sensitivities than um, healthy, uh, fit adult males. The American Academy of Environmental Medicine also said that radiofrequency radiation causes adverse health effects. This was just last year. The United Teachers of Los Angeles informed their workers about uh, changes in RF exposure. They want to promote technology that has the lowest levels of exposure. And in British Columbia, the Teachers Federation, um, one of the teachers was accommodated there with electrohypersensitivity. And I know that there's one person on the line um, who's been accommodated in Quebec as well. So we're beginning to see some recognition that this form of radiation is, is potentially harmful um, to staff um, and obviously to children. Next slide, please. I'd like to end on this, and, and I'd like to s suggest that there's two websites. There's quite a few websites now that are very good, and I'm just suggesting two. One is safeschools.ca. Uh, my website is going to have this presentation on there for anyone who would like to download it as a PDF file. And you know, one of my favorite um, uh, and inspirational um, people is Martin Luther King Jr., who said, "Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter." I do know that teachers have spoken out. In some schools, they're well accepted. In other schools, 
um, they've been marginalized because of speaking out. I know that parents have tried to educate school boards and trying to get them to use wired technology, but there's a very strong resistance to this, and I think by sharing information with others who are motivated to keep the school environment as safe as possible, not only for, for teachers but for students as well and other staff, um, I think that would go a very long way in, in changing this and making our uh, world a lot healthier. And I'd like to end on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Magda. Um, a reminder, if uh, anybody has a question they'd like to ask, to please use your send note. Um, capability on the screen. Uh, I, I don't have any questions yet, so. I know there's uh, Marie-Claude um, from Quebec. She's on, on the site, and I was wondering if she would be willing to share some of her experiences. Um, she is a teacher in Quebec. OK, uh, I'm not sure uh, uh, what phone she's attached to because uh, many folks did not attach their computer to their phone. Okay. So um, if uh, Marie Claude could uh, do that, uh, you should be able to link your phone with your computer by right clicking on your name. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, type, type them in. We'll uh, stay here for another minute and see if anybody has any questions. And um, Patty, I'm going to unmute you and see if uh, you have anything to add. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Ma Magda. That was um, extremely informative. Um, one of the things that uh, that I that I was going to um, ask you to explain a little bit more uh, more thoroughly was how um, microwave radiation uh, actually is um, is impacting um, fetal development, especially in the brain. Uh, well, we know very little about how it's affecting fetal de fetal development in the brain. Uh, um, apart from adults, because there's a lot of information now on adults. And microwave radiation has several different effects on the body. And it's difficult to determine, um, because all of the mechanisms are interactive, it's difficult to determine uh, which one is the key one and which, was, which mechanisms are secondary. We have evidence that microwave radiation actually increases the permeability of the blood-brain barrier. This is in adults. And what that means is that the blood-brain barrier is, is a very important mechanism to protect the brain so that chemicals can't get into the brain and then get stuck in the brain and cause neurological damage. Once a chemical does get into the brain and it can't get out, that's when we have problems. So you don't want things like aluminum and mercury getting into the brain. When you hold a cell phone to your head, that um, barrier becomes permeable for a period of time, and it's, just, it's debated as to how long that time might be in different individuals. But once you get these um, chemicals getting into the brain, they're the ones who can do some of the damage. And what's fascinating to me about this is that doctors recognize that this is the case. And when they're trying to give their patients medication that is intended for the brain and they're having difficulty getting it past the blood-brain barrier, what they will do is they will expose their patients to microwave radiation, fairly high levels for a short period of time. It increases the permeability of the brain, allows the chemical in, and then the, the, the thinking is that when you remove the radiation, eventually the, the permeability decreases again and it's protective again. Um, and so this has been used therapeutically to actually uh, get chemicals into the brain. So Magda, we do have a few questions. Did you uh, want to finish that thought? Uh, well, no, we can, we, can, we can go to the questions. Okay, the first question um, is uh, from Mary Redmayne, and she asks if there's any data available on the proportion of women who carry or have carried a phone in their bra uh, she's looking at doing a pilot study in Australia. 
I haven't seen anything on the proportion, but a study looking at that I think would be very important because young, particularly young girls, that's how they carry their phone. They don't want a purse. They just want something, you know, really sleek. Uh, and we have to somehow educate them that this is not a smart thing to do, just like we have to educate young boys that they shouldn't keep it in their in their pocket either. So um, I think a study like that would be very useful. Okay, the next. Maybe oh, there ahead. are others on the line that um, might have more information about some of this that they could jump in at some stage as well. Okay. Uh, another question is, is more distance from the source of the microwave radiation always better for you? What about the blood-brain barrier penetration, which is more common at lower exposures? Well, that's interesting because low, it's not always the highest exposure that's causing the damage. And if you... What's fascinating is that a lot of what we understand about radiation effects, we're basing it on our understanding of chemical toxicants, so toxic substances that are based on the chemistry. And very often with those, the higher the level, the greater the, the, the problem, the higher the dosage, the greater the toxic. It's not true with electromagnetic radiation, however, and I think the reason for that is that our bodies, our cells in our bodies are actually interacting with each other um, through chemicals and through uh, electromagnetic energy. And there's more and more evidence that if we could pick up the signal um, of one cell whispering to another, which is what uh, Dr. Aidy said happens, um, if we could interrupt that signal and give a false message to a cell, we could disrupt that cell. So we're not disrupting it with chemicals, we're not disrupting it with energy, we're disrupting it with information. And this is a very powerful and very um, exciting new development in, in uh, human medicine or human biology. And it makes a heck of a lot of sense. So it means that we have to understand what the sig how our body signal e individual cells, uh, signal the rest of the body, and how to prevent interacting with that, interfering with that messaging system. And that's why very low levels can have very powerful effects because the body misunderstands the message and then reacts a certain way. So, Magda, we have a question about um, exposure of uh, the effects on the eyes from looking at monitors and phone screens. Is there information about the impact of that? I haven't followed the literature in that. Uh, what I can say, however, is that Anecdotally, uh, a lot of people who spend time on computers, who, who now spend hours a day on a computer, their eyesight is actually d deteriorating much more rapidly. We do know that the eyes are very sensitive microwaves. We, we shouldn't be getting microwaves from a screen on a computer. The old-fashioned TV sets had you know, um, soft x-rays and, and things of that nature, and mothers very often told their kids to sit back, which was very good advice. But the more time you spend on a screen looking at the, the photons coming into your head, um, I think there can be harmful effects of that. We recently purchased something called a light noise detector from Germany, and we found that some computer screens are electromagnetically clean in the sense that the light doesn't have any high frequencies coming into your head. Other screens are absolutely horrible. And so we're hoping to ultimately do some research on that to find out whether or not it affects vision, whether or not it affects you in other ways as well. Uh, Magda, there's a question about whether or not a fe fetus in the womb is more protected from uh, the EMF radiation than a, uh, a child that is in a classroom. Okay, that's, that's an interesting point. Um, there are two aspects to this. One is a fetus in a womb is going to be surrounded by um, a lot of tissue, the mother's belly, uh, as well as the um, amniotic fluid, all the water in there. Depending on the wavelength uh, or the frequency of the microwave radiation, the higher the frequency, so when we're talking about high gigahertz, it tends to penetrate less deeply into tissue than some of the lower frequencies. So how deeply it penetrates through the water to get to the fetus um, will be a function of what you're exposed to. So, you know, very generally I think you can say that uh, some of the longer wavelengths will have some greater penetrating power within the low uh, microwave band of the spectrum. When it comes to a child, and also the fetus because of its 
it's growing so rapidly, if anything goes wrong, it's, it's, it makes a huge effect. Um, if you're older and your, your cells are dividing very slowly and you have some sort of genetic defect that comes up, um, because they're dividing so slowly, you know, your, your cancer or whatever develops is going to be much slower. That's not the case in children and certainly not the case in the fetus. So the two things uh, the fetus and young children have in common is that they're growing rapidly. The young child is not surrounded by anything, and increasingly they're exposed at school and at home, and so their body doesn't have a chance to um, regenerate itself. Their body is under constant stress, and this is based on some of the work of uh, Martin Blank uh, at uh, Columbia University showing that there's an increase in stress proteins. And we know that if you, don't, if, you're, if you have stress proteins in the middle of the night, your body simply cannot heal. And it's this inability to heal, I think, which is one of the most um, uh, damaging when it comes to chronic exposure. Uh, Magda, could you refer folks to resources related to wireless phones, both uh, mobile and home, like the cordless phones? Well, with the cordless phones, there's something very interesting here. The cordless phones that you can buy in, uh, in Europe, mostly in Switzerland, Swiss has, um, Swisscom, the uh, telecom industry in Switzerland, has a patent on a phone that is a cordless phone that you use in your house that only, it only radiates when you pick it up and you start using it. The phones we have here in North America are just like the beacon signal from the Wi-Fi. They're radiating constantly. We used to be able to buy these phones um, here in North America, and I was told that the FCC actually banned them, and I'm not quite certain why. So what I'm hoping is that someone who's you know, into manufacturing and import can actually import these phones so that we can use them because it would reduce levels of exposure in a home enormously just by replacing the cordless phone and doing the same for the um, baby monitor. Uh, because baby monitors are the same in, in uh, Europe. They're voice activated, so they're not emitting all the time. Uh, as soon as the baby cries, the signal goes out and the parent can respond. Uh, I have a question uh, from uh, someone that asks if, if there's any official site or resource where teachers or parents can report observations uh, where they may suspect changing health conditions or cognitive effects either uh, about their students or themselves in, react in reaction to the wireless technology in their schools. I do know that some teachers are hoping that this will be done within their school boards. They're a little concerned that if the school board takes it over um, that that information won't be made public. There's obviously some privacy concerns, so you'd have to somehow uh, shield, you know, the people that you're you're referring to in the in the uh, uh, reports. But this is absolutely critical, and I don't know of anywhere where they're doing this. But that's not because they aren't doing it anywhere. It's just that I'm not aware of it. So if there's anyone else on the call who is familiar with where they're doing this, I think that would be very useful information. All right. Uh Mary Redding did uh, give a note that said that her 2009 study in terms of uh, girls and uh, storing their cell phones in their bras, uh, she found about three out of 100, every 180 girls of 11 and 12 years of age carried their phone in their bra uh, at three different schools. Of course, here we are uh, five years later, over five years later, and um, I would imagine there's uh, quite an increase in the use of cell phones with younger uh, kids and tweeners and t teens. Uh, mm -hmm. So who knows what that uh, number can be now. Mm -hmm. um, I have uh, one more question about the blood-brain barrier. And um, Uh, and Ali Johansson says a phone could breach that barrier at a few feet, and then there's a, contra uh, a contrasting opinion about it being breached at three to five feet from a router. Uh, and then, of course, there's the uh, feeling that we don't really know exactly. Uh, so uh, can you speak about uh, the research about uh, proximity and the blood-brain barrier? I, I couldn't give you a more precise answer on that. I don't do research within that area, so I, I rely on the studies that are done by others. Um, 
Um, so I, I can't give you a specific answer on that. Okay. Well, to make uh, people jealous, uh, Ms. Redmayne reports that Australia does have a site, official site, for registering effects that have been noticed uh, from electromagnetic radiation, but uh, uh, it is unknown if we have that sort of thing here. Um, if people are interested, uh, one of the important things in this web webinar serves this purpose is to educate ourselves and our colleagues on this issue and perhaps creating something uh, within your own uh, school district or workplace through the union or if you're lucky to have an employer with an open mind to also perhaps um, ask for uh, some, some official uh, registration of these kinds of concerns. It would also be very good to, I, I interact with people across North America, you know, very often mothers or teachers who are trying to do something, and they're, they're very much isolated. They might have one or two colleagues who are helping them. Um, but somehow getting all of these people together and sharing their successes and sharing what they've done, I think, would go a very long way. Sharing resources that they've discovered uh, would be very useful. Okay. Uh, I'm not seeing too much else. Uh, just a reminder about the importance of uh, giving advice of turning off your wireless technology as often as possible when you do not need it. Don't have transmitting devices in your bedroom. Uh, have them as far away from where you most often are located and have a conversation for those of you in school districts and workplaces about asking where are your wireless routers located and whether or not it could be possible to uh, change their location. And Patty, do you want to re, uh, reiterate the uh, placement issue for wireless routers in schools, please? Um, well, the issues are that um, that many of them are are actually hidden from view. They might be up above a, a drop ceiling, um, or they may actually be in a uh, an adjacent room um, where a, you know a teacher would not know where they uh, where it was. And so we're uh, we are really thinking that just signage um, would be a good place to start, so that teachers would actually be aware of where those routers are. And uh, in some cases, uh, since proximity is is a is very important piece of this picture, um, you know, rather than sitting, you know, having your your desk directly underneath a router, you might put your you know bookcases there, or something that you know um, something that uh, is not important, um, you know, as far as being exposed. Um, so that's that's one of the things that we would love to see, and of course. Um, you know, having a, a Wi-Fi free school and having a, uh, you know, a wired school um, is probably the best thing. Uh, and then, in uh, you know, the next best thing to that um, would be uh, would be the ability to turn off those routers whenever they are in use, and, uh, not just not only the routers, but also as Dr. Um, Havis has mentioned, um, when the children have actually downloaded. Or um, or sent um, information that they need to if they're taking tests and so on. Um, they can then turn their turn their wireless off or go into airplane mode, um, and then not be exposed um, sitting at their desks. So uh, I think everybody got a note from uh, Dr. Moskowitz, Professor Moskowitz, uh, giving the website at UCAL Berkeley of SaferEMR.com, which is an excellent resource. A lot of uh, mentions of scientific studies uh, about this kind of exposure. And um, we had a question. I don't know if anybody can, uh, because I do not know who this person is. It is uh, access to the archive of Dr. Zorak Glazer. And Magda, maybe you can speak to who that is and why that right. might be relevant. Well, Dr. Zori Glazier worked for the um, U.S. Um, military uh, back in the 60s and 70s, and he was their microwave expert. Um, he traveled the globe. He was able to get documents from different countries, have them translated. And he retired, and his entire he gave me his entire archive um, of documents, over 6,000 documents, many of them just not available uh, anymore. 
and we're in the process of having them scanned into PDF files, and I've posted a number of some of the better ones on my website. Um, and this is um, Carlos Sosa who's trying to convince me to do more of that, and I've just you know run out of time and money to do that. But I agree with him. This needs to be made public. Uh, we knew about this 50, 60 years ago, and um, basically the information was kept confidential. And now it's available. All of it has been declassified, so it's available to everyone. The other thing I'd like, and, and Carlo, Carlos, I'm trying to do that. The other thing I'd like to draw your attention to is that Barb Payne actually has a number of very excellent websites uh, that she's referred to as well. So uh, people might want to check that link because I think she sent it to everyone. Yes. All right, and with that, it looks like. Uh, uh, we don't have any more questions, so thank you so much, uh, Magda and uh, Patty. Uh, the information is very valuable uh, to our members and other people who joined us today. Again, this webinar was recorded, and um, I don't, don't know exactly when it will be posted. There's a NYSIT website. It will be off of the health and safety page, workplace health and safety, but hopefully uh, we're going to have that yeah. within a matter of uh, a couple of weeks. Um, could, I so just, uh, could I just also mention that, as I said earlier, the um, slides will be are available now on my website, www.magdahavis.com. And this Saturday, um, we're going to be interviewed on Coast to Coast, uh, talking about some of the electrosensitivity research and some of the healing therapies and, and effects on not only humans but on plants as well. So if people are interested, it's this um, Saturday, December 13th, um, and it's at 10 o'clock Pacific time, um, 10 to 11 Pacific uh, Standard Time. Uh, Meg, that before we uh, absolutely get off the webinar, I don't know if you noticed uh, Deborah Kobold's question about uh, EMF exposure and um, uh, the uh, absorption of certain uh, drugs. Okay, I'm particularly just reading now. Uh, the question was about uh, if you could comment about the suggestion uh, from Dr. Frey uh, that the pulse modulated microwave radiation affects the way the drugs are absorbed in the body, uh, including amphetamines and Haldol, et cetera, and uh, the impl implication of kids in schools from that. We have many kids who are on prescription medications. I don't know enough about that to make an intelligent comment. Um, okay. And uh, another question, we have one more question. Uh, if you have a sense of any of the healing therapies that are out there for people who have been exposed to and believe that they are having some health effects and sensitivities. Yes, my research is uh, part of my research is actually shifting to looking at healing therapies because I was always concerned that individuals who are electrically hypersensitive won't be able to use these therapies. But we're finding absolutely re remarkable improvements in certainly in blood circulation, in pain relief, in um, decreased swelling. Um, these technologies once again have been around for decades. They're um, licensed in the United States for two things. One is healing bone fractures, and the other is transcranial magnetic stimulation for people who are depressed. Um, they're licensed in Canada for, for other things as well, and, and uh, we actually have licensed technologies that are Health Canada approved. Um, so my research is looking at that plus light, and I think we're going to be very pleasantly surprised that it, Electrically sensitive people can use them depending on what the device is, and it can help them recover, uh, especially from um, anything that uh, deals with pain and blood circulation problems. Okay, great. Um, is there any way, are, are there any um, testing, is there testing equipment to check and ex assess what kind of exposure exists in a classroom or workplace? Yes, there are meters available, um, and they vary in their, their accuracy, but they will certainly give you a sense of how much relative exposure there is. And the site, um, lessemf.com, www.lessemf.com, sells a large um, range of meters that vary in price. Uh, and there are some good ones. And on my website, I, people ask me this question, like, which meter should I buy? 
and I have some advice on my website. So if you go in there and, and do a query about um, recommended meters, it will come up and it will tell you if you are interested in measuring radio frequency, these are good meters. If you are interested in electromagnetic fields, these are good meters, etc. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, again, we're, we're going to end the uh, webinar. Thank you all for participating. And uh, we will inform people when we have another uh, webinar on another interesting topic. So thank you very much. Thank you.